So I, I, I think uh, speaking of um, Web3 ecosystem, venture ecosystem, uh, I know, uh, Pearl, you actually invest more broadly in the um, early stage tech ecosystem, right? Uh, and, and Web3 is one of your focus areas. Uh, it, over the past, I think if you look at 18, 12 months, uh, there's been some radical changes that have happened in the funding environment, right? Uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts to what changes you are seeing, uh, just in general, uh, more broadly in the tech ecosystem and more specifically in the Web3 ecosystem, if there are any sectors that you're looking at that are uh, having more meaningful changes than others, we'd love to hear those thoughts. No, absolutely. I think uh, we all can agree that 2023 and late 2022 is very different from what the markets were before. The environment has completely changed. I mean, in the recent uh, last 48 hours, everything that has unfolded just makes it even more crystal clear that a lot of cheap money being printed and given in the hands of folks has led to crazy valuations been given throughout 2021 and 2022 that is finally starting to correct. So I think in the broader tech ecosystem, that's what we are seeing. Uh, we're seeing that a lot of the founders now are raising at reasonable valuations. There is increased focus on profitability and also increased focus on um, you know, what's the final sort of product and utility that I'm actually building for? As opposed to coming up with ideas, going out, raising, and then figuring out what needs to be built and how to validate the valuation at which they've raised. And I think within Web3 as well, um, it's a similar phenomena that we are seeing. Uh, because Web3 at the end of the day is no different. Um, it's just a different technology that powers different kinds of use cases. Um, where people have realized that, uh, you know, internally we had a, a, a term for it, just another content platform with token offering. Uh, so those have gone away. You don't see another content platform come up uh, because people have realized that, yes, it does power content creators and it gives them immense um, freedom to really express and get money, get value out of, uh, out of what they're creating. But at the end of the day, there has to be utility to the end users. If there aren't end users who are coming, who are spending time and actually enjoying being on a particular app or a platform, it doesn't make sense. And I think now that that has settled in, a lot of the platforms that are coming are either utility focused, where they're trying to figure out um, how to focus on user centricity and build something that aligns with what users actually want. So start doing user research and then work backwards and see if you can add Web3 or blockchain angle to it. The second is developer tools and infra tools. A lot of middleware coming up because we know that from the past experience that we've had, user onboarding is broken, user targeting is broken, retargeting doesn't exist completely. Um, deploying, managing, scaling is very difficult of apps. So solutions that can actually help, so the next set of user applications that get built can be scalable and can be done easily. Great, thank, thank you so much, Pearl. Um, actually, um, I'd love to double click a little bit on that um, uh, topic of middleware. And I know, um, Ravi Sundarajan, you, you have a, a venture studio specifically focused on Web3 and, and generative AI as well. Um, how, how, do you, how do you look at those spaces specifically? How do you leverage your capabilities as a venture studio because you are now building for these um, right. um, Web3 ecosystem players. Um, and there is, there is a lot of movement in from, let's say, you know, the, the NFTs of the world and, and community-driven projects to that middleware, that infrastructure layer. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how are you looking at that and how are you actually assisting these companies build out for that? Yeah. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, we believe uh, middleware actually provides a uh, significant potential uh, to uh, create cross-industry utilities um, that will integrate with, uh, uh, with you know, blockchain adoption, right? So, um, the, you know, as, as, as Paul mentioned, right, think about it, Web 2 or Web 3, end of the day what Web 3 does is it enables creators to uh, own the uh, stuff they're creating, to better ownership, uh, and get rewarded for it. But it doesn't change the fact that whatever you do, you still need to segment the market. And, you know, for, you know, hundreds of years, whatever technology has changed, marketing has been changed. 
it's about user segmentation, user targeting, and figuring out which segment you're targeting and what you're serving, right? So we believe that there are four areas of middleware that are ripe for um, innovation. Uh, and there may be more, but at least we are focusing on these four areas. Uh, one is um, decentralized identity management. Uh, the second is around the node service governance and scalability. Uh, the, the third one is um, more around the uh, data access, privacy, um, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, analytics, you know, data access analytics, because even from Web2 to, uh, you, you, whatever you create, you have to have a way of transitioning some of this data and analytics, especially if you have to go for enterprise use cases, right. uh, even interfacing with, uh, you know, Amazon analytics or stuff like that. So you have to have that access and privacy, obviously, you want to get better right. privacy, better access, and better that, and finally is around uh, the Oracle, right? Because obviously, off chain and off right. chain, you need to have that. So, those are some areas that if we focus on those areas, we think that we'll be able to solve real world enterprise problems that will generate a lot of revenue. And obviously, currently, we are focused on NFT marketplaces and uh, exchanges, but I think that will provide a huge potential and obviously <coughs> a lot of stuff to be done in that area. Got it, got it. Th thank you. That makes a lot of sense. Um, in fact, Web3, in, in terms of actually investments, like we're all, in some way, shape, or form, we're investing, being entrepreneurs as well. Uh, th there, is, there is a sense uh, that we share a lot from whether it's Bay Area um, or, you know, Singapore-based VCs or so on. Th there's a sense that there's a lot of deep tech um, uh, diligence involved. I, and deep tech, I don't mean the, the deep tech from, from technology venture standpoint, but much deeper technology um, diligence involved. Um, than a, a typical, let's say, a, a B2B SaaS um, uh, investment that a, that a venture uh, capitalist might do. Uh, so, so, Watsal, you are, um, uh, you know, especially suited for that. You, you, you are a CTO at um, uh, 100XVC, right? You're also a broader-based uh, fund, but you invest primarily, um, you know, in Web3 as one of the subsectors of the tech ecosystem. Uh, I'd love to hear from you, uh, how is the process for investment into a Web3 company different than, let's say, a, a more traditional tech company, uh, which, is, which might be building still in the tech ecosystem, but, but not Web3 blockchain. And how, how deep do you get in the, in the blockchain infrastructure or the, the technologies uh, that are needed to be reviewed before the investments? Thank you so much. Hello. Yeah. Um, thanks so much. Um, hey, everyone. Good to be here. Uh, so, as you mentioned, right, um, investing in this space is uh, equivalent to investing in like deep tech startups. Um, see, I mean, we all know the you know FAT protocol thesis from years ago, right? In in the blockchain space, value accrual happens at the protocol layer, right? And so, anytime you're investing or evaluating a Web3 startup, right? You're basically saying okay there is no real moat in the client or the interface or anything it's about have they really built something unique in the protocol itself now if i had to build a dex i can easily say okay i'll just fork uniswap today add a couple bells and whistles and say it's a new dex but that doesn't really make it something worthwhile right now we have to really deep dive into the product and see okay are they solving some problems that Uniswap has, right? Is their um, yield curve better? Is there, um, uh, is, there, uh, uh, is there a solution they have built for MEV protection? Whatever it is, right? Or if you're looking at uh, games, right? Are they doing strongly on-chain games? Are they building uh, game logic on-chain? Then, of, of course, on top of that comes the whole process of go-to-market, market making, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But at the core, is there some innovation or not? That's kind of where my role in comes in, right? When you're investing in a Web3 company, you're looking for extreme core innovation at the protocol layer. And if it's not there, then you, you, it can't be incremental, okay, I just added a 10% improvement on top of Uniswap. Because in the end, what also happens is, today, if I build something which is 10% better than Uniswap, Uniswap v4, they can easily build it out. You right. have to build it open source, right? So that's where my role comes in. That's where kind of we go very deep into the code base and uh, understand technically kind of how they're building it out. 
great, great. We need that. That's very helpful. Um, so, sorry, Watsal. We need you coming to you next. Um, I, I know you, you've been a very prolific investor in this space. Uh, uh, I think you're very focused on the Web3 uh, blockchain ecosystem. You invest out of the Middle East, your Cypher Capital Fund, as well as a few others, I think. Uh, how, uh, you know, tech is one side, and then um, uh, Watsal mentioned GTM is, is next. Like, this is one of those things that, so how do you look at that portion? How, how does a company that is more, uh, you know, more Web3 centric than not, how do the GDM strategies look different? Uh, how are they similar to more traditional uh, tech companies? I'd uh, love to hear your thoughts on those. Uh, so before I go into that, I'll explain a bit on how we look at this whole sector. Uh, you know, we have 400 million wallets exist in the world as, as of now. There's less than four, if I assume one wallet is one person, it's less than four percent. We have not even started. It's like the 1980s of the Indian stock market, where no one has a clue what a stock represents. This is where you have those scams of Ashad Mehta's and Ketan Farak's, and this is where the Junjunwalas get formed. We are so early when we talk about future on Bitcoin, crypto, it's, it's still evolving. And now coming to go-to-market strategies and things, and again, because you had a show of hands where people were developing, in fact, one show of hands. How many of you have actually lent or borrowed on Aave, Compound or anything? See, that's the percentage of adoption. Yeah. It's not even 1%. Yeah. So we actually haven't started on the adoption scale. Yeah. Now, when it comes to go-to-market strategies, you know, I, we, we meet a lot of people who want to build up these lending borrowing uh, protocols. I, I don't know how many of you remember Anchor Protocol that was giving 20% a year. Yeah, oh, you remember. I'm sure how you lost money. Last? <laughs> yeah. So I, I actually don't do 20% a year businesses, so that's why I saved my money. But again, you know, adoption is not going to come by paying people 20%. That's basically a Ponzi scheme. Adoption will come, and that is where go-to-market strategies come. You know, because when I talk to founders, I'm like, okay, what's your go-to-market strategy? I'll do this marketing ad, and I will get influencers, and there's this whole BS about community building. But actually, go-to-market strategy is someone landing with a stable coin in Zimbabwe and replacing the US dollar with the USDT. Someone landing up in Lebanon and giving an Aave compound attached to a credit card or a or debit card to actually use it for transactions. Suddenly you have 10 million customers overnight. Yeah. Uh, and the complexity of all this is, you know, 2017 was all about someone wanted to plant a tree in Africa, let's do an ICO. It has no connection with blockchain. 2020 was use cases and uh, 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 ICOs. So, you know, you had Aave's, Compound, Fractal, where there was real use case. You can lend, borrow, you can do stable coins. And I think the next season is all, 2024 is all about use cases, uh, ICOs and adoption. How will you get the next billion users on board? And in that sense, going to these uh, Latin, Latin American countries, Africa, is where, you know, you will have to do groundwork and find out the problems that you can solve. Right. Not launching tokens is not go-to-market <laughs> strategy. Sure. Sure. Make, makes a lot of sense. Thank you, Vineet. Thank you. Um, uh, me, me, speaking of, um, you know, the GTM strategies, one of the core things is also um, user experience, right? Naksha, we'll come to you next. Um, I, I know at uh, Draper Dragon, um, you know, your global fund, you invest uh, very prolifically, uh, you know, globally, and, and you are helping lead the Indian um, arm of that. Uh, what, what have you seen uh, from the um, user experience side of things uh, that that should be different? Now, how you know, it's been a lot of times Web3 or original crypto applications have been very, very clunky. Right? There, there's been uh, you know, the, the Web3 native people or crypto native people have been able to use them, maybe you know, coders, developers, but there has been uh, lacking in terms of experience, uh, user experience when, when it comes to these applications. How do, you, how do you view that? Is it still so early that we don't need to worry about it? Or is it so late that we must have the best, absolute best uh, UI UX before we can make more progress in the, in the ecosystem? Uh, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, so very good question, Ravi. I think everybody that's in the Web3 space is wondering, you know, how do we get past this, uh, you know, as we need mentioned, the 4% adoption mark, right? So if you look at consumer apps, you know, they, they need to be engrossing. They need to be intriguing to the point that people forget what tech they're using. Is it AR, is it AI, is it blockchain, or whatever, right? So we have to, we've yet to get to that point. But to be honest, I think we were just not ready as from an infra standpoint until now. And so a lot of our infra investments over the years 
are now taking us closer to a point wherein you know those jittery and laggy experiences will go away. When you look at you know UI and UA, UX experience standpoint, so I, I think so, you know in the social side of things, a lot of things are picking up where things are more about network, where things are more about free speech, or you know if if you're if you can unlock yourself from let's say a Twitter because you know some sort of censorship is not something that you relate to, or a YouTube where you know, uh, a, a popular content creator does not get lost, you know, the moment they sort of step away uh, from following the guidelines of a particular platform, right? So from that standpoint, for social networks, I feel decentralized social graphs, again, is an infra, uh, you know, uh, innovation, but it does not take a lot on the UI, UX standpoint for a social app like that to pick up. But when you talk about gaming, so we've, I've invested in a few games, the, the team is very proud of its, uh, you know, gaming investments all across the globe. So, for example, Crop Bites, I love the way they, you know, built on the original paradigm of Farmville, right? Uh, so, so I feel great about the fact that, you know, these, in, these ideas that people relate to in Web 2.5 construction, you know, it's very easy to incentivize people with financial incentives, right? So now we've gotten to that point, but we've not yet added the utility of, you know, finding that, that, what's that next thing that Web3 is going to offer to these games outside of financial incentives, right? So the, I think it's now, it's, it's the moment where you find those hooks beyond that added zeitgeist of decentralization. So essentially, I would, I would say that, you know, find those Web 2.5 constructs at first, and, you know, in, in no time, I see the infrastructure to be ready, right? So it's going to get there very soon, and sooner than we all imagine, right? And that's the point where I see the UI, UX, is going to be a lot better. I mean, just look at the you know UI of any Web3 you know company. The the apps look phenomenal. I love uh, you know Coin DCX's new app. I, you know, uh, being an investor, you know, I'm, I'm so proud. But otherwise, also right. So we're getting to the point that people are realizing that you know Nokri.coms of the world, they need to innovate. Look at what Web3 is doing. We are the poster for where uh, you know UI can get to. Yeah. So I'm very proud of the direction we're getting to, but once infrastructure's solutions get solved, Web3 native games are going to be coming as well. Right? So that, that'll be my thought for uh, you know, adopting with a hook something add-on, but definitely, again, agreeing with Watsell that it's not going to be 10% addition. It's going to be phenomenally what can you bring to the table that has not yet been seen. Got it. That's, that's great. Thank you, Akshay. Um, so switching tax a little bit, um, Harsh, I know you, um, y you help invest from Kyber Ventures, right? And you, again, it's, it's a global um, um, fund uh, from, from the DEX, uh, and you're helping them invest in India, Southeast Asia more broadly. Uh, from uh, going, going away from, from, let's say, the consumer applications for a second, um, and, and looking at the, the foundations a little bit, I know you, you've been very um, interested and active on the um, infrastructure on the real world asset side how do you how do you bridge between real world assets let's say there is a there is an application between um, a real estate uh, developer who, who wants to now put it on the blockchain uh, you know tokenize it or what, what have you uh, but there is a bridge to be had there right and and how do you evaluate something like that well, what are the constructs that you use to say that okay this this is actually going to work versus uh, this has no uh, you know whether it's regulatory or not but uh, this may not uh, go go very well how, how do you look at those things sure Ravi so we we were the, always like from 2016 we are the leaders in stepping or setting the stone like we were the world first dex now after that we incubated uniswap one inch we were the one who behind wbtc crystal and many more so we know the what where the DeFi area is going on we have like earlier that time vitalik was our founder so we have a good connection with ethereum so we are here to broadify the DeFi ecosystem now coming to the RWAs and the bridging between TradeFi and I say CryptoFi or crypto assets. So the things are pretty uh, native here. Now, if you talk about DeFi, most of the people say DeFi means buying, selling, lending, borrowing, or swapping. No, DeFi is not that because it's a decentralized finance. Finance is a very broad term where money comes in. So if in, if in a single export and import transaction, I can create six ecosystem there from lend letter of credit, asset securitization, invoice discounting, billing, asset leasing. So finance is very big. So I'm here like we are now 
to set an, another stepping stone to create a, a, another economy wherein people will use the finance. Right now, if you're sitting in India, and if you want to, like last week only, I, I, or like I said my friend to bring an iPhone for me in Dubai. The thing is, in India, I had to buy USDC at premium. So here also, like for an iPhone, I had to pay extra. Like if I'm in, let's say in Zimbabwe, and I want to transit with somewhere in a, in a village in Chile or in Mexico, so still I have to pay the premium or maybe some extra premium like that way, like went up to 15 to 20%. And if I talk about export or import businesses, like people still pay 30%, 50%. <coughs> APY, whether they want to borrow money, they want to discount their bills or something like that. But if you see the DeFi ecosystem, in DeFi, money is there, players are there, developers are there. Just we need a good bridges. And to evaluate these bridges, yeah, it's now that like if we say about the timing, timing is a good timing, but we need some tech stability there because lots of bridge hacked has been happened in, like in last year tech ecosystem plus finance ecosystem, we had to merge that thing. So we basically look in the team member, founders, I myself from, I've been into investment banking, I work with JP Morgan ONX team. I've also served as a private equity guy in global growth, Florida. So I know how finance ecosystem work. So we are here to integrate finance with tech. So this is the next area like we'll be focusing on and we'll be bringing the DeFi to the next where the liquidity will be one trillion. It's awesome. not like in billions. Awesome. Th thank you, Harsh. Actually, I just want to do a time check. So what was that uh, buzzer for? Are we out of time already? We are out of time? How, how much did we have? 30 minutes? And we, we've done 30 minutes? That is awesome. I mean, I, I, I could sit here. I, I, I think we could sit here another three hours at that rate. Uh, but, I, I, you know, there's so many um, great questions I'd love to uh, get your inputs on. Um, but, um, Rohit, and I... I you know, I'd love to hear, and Akshay mentioned about the, uh, uh, how great an app CoinDCX is. Uh, from, well, put your investor hat again, um, right? Of course, I know you, you deal a lot with um, across uh, the, the CoinDCX venture ecosystem versus the strategy and so on. But putting your, your investor hat, we have, um, it, you know, we, there was, during the ICO boom, the tokenization and all those you know, token offerings were, were a lot of rage, as, as Vineet, you mentioned. Um, but how do you look at, you know, even today, there are certain, you know, when we structure these transactions, uh, a number of these companies, especially the infrastructure companies, are doing, um, uh, you know, pure equity uh, rounds, and, and that is one way to do it. Some are doing warrants over tokens and so on. Um, but how do you look at, how do you differentiate when is the right time to raise on a, on a token or, or a hybrid versus just doing equities? W what are your thoughts on those? Sure. Um, so I think, the you know, at a very base level, the fundamentals of investing are the same. Whether it's Web2, whether it's Web3, whether it's equity, whether it's tokens, the fundamentals of building a business or the fundamentals of investing are the same. So that's the baseline. Now, to your specific question on equity versus token, as far as we are concerned, um, you know, if it's an early stage investment, we will invest only where we're getting, if the company plans to issue a token, we will invest only if you're investing in tokens and equity. Mm -hmm. And we're getting the token grant along with the equity. And the simple reason for that is, you know, down the line when they issue tokens, part of the value that the protocol generates, some of it comes to the equity holder, some of it goes to the token holders. So now, as an early stage investor, I cannot not have a share of the pie which would also go to the token holders. So as an early stage investor, I would certainly invest uh, only in opportunities where we're getting both equity and tokens. Um, you know, at, in, in later stage rounds, much later stage companies with, uh, you know, where the tokens have already been listed, they've been listed for a while, the monetization mechanisms and the revenue split between tokens and equity is kind of hard-coded into the smart contract. At that point, we can consider investing in the tokens because I know what I'm getting. Um, you know, but I wouldn't invest uh, only in equity, whereas I know a company is going to issue a token uh, you know, later in the day. Uh, 